it's such a pleasure to see all of you. And uh, you know, it's sort of intimidating following that last panel because they were, it was so personable and so like real every single day. So it's, uh, it's great. We're gonna switch a little bit from talking about you know, individual stories to really think about how industry can play a role in lives and what, you know, this is no longer, technology is transforming our lives every single day. There's no moment that you go today and you're not thinking about either your mobile phone or thinking about the technology and the data that you have coming at you and what decisions you can make. And so we're here with two incredible industry leaders to talk about what is happening in technology, what it means for our own personal transformations, but also knowing that alone government can't solve all of our problems and neither can private industry. So where are the opportunities to come together here? So I am gonna start with you, Brad. Um, you know, you're in an industry that's so rapidly changing. Data has become the, in. there's so much information, there's so many ways we can think about the use of information. But how do you all think about as an industry on inclusion? What does that mean to you from, from an industry perspective? Well, I think the goal is obviously to drive economic growth in a way that is far more inclusive of the entire human population than it is today. And I think that's probably what unites almost everybody in the room or online. And I, I think if you want to have a real impact, you actually have to have a theory of systemic change and not how you just do your own good thing, as helpful as that may be. So for me, I'd say imagine a PowerPoint slide in your head. What more could you ask for Microsoft today? <laughs> I'd say, look, at the top row, you start with people need money. They need access to capital. That's where the Center for Inclusive Growth comes in. Then they need access to technology. They need access to electricity. Let's not forget, it was the most important invention of the 19th century. There's still 750 million people in the world that don't have it. They need connectivity. That's where Verizon and others, and us to a little degree, come in. They need a device, and then they need skills. The skills to put all of that to work and do all the things they want to do. Now the other row beneath that also has three boxes. First, there's the market. It's really hard to have inclusive growth without a well-functioning economic market with less corruption and the like. And the market is often the best at innovating developing new technologies. That's where we very much come in. Second, there's nonprofits. You know, four million nonprofits in the world. They're often the best at incubating new solutions and delivering services. And the third is government. And at the end of the day, especially when it comes to correcting market failure or bringing services at scale, there is no substitute, in my view, for the government. And then you have to put all of those things together and figure out where you contribute. We contribute to connectivity. We contribute to devices. We contribute to skilling. That's where Microsoft Philanthropies really focuses a lot of its resources. We have a special role to play in supporting nonprofits. We have hundreds of thousands of nonprofits that run in the Microsoft Cloud. We provide $5 billion of technology discounts and donations to nonprofits, it would make us one of the 10 largest foreign aid budgets in the world. And that's sort of how I try to think about that picture every day. Yeah, there's so much to dig into that. I'm gonna to come to you in just a sec, come back to you in just a minute on that. Hans, the mobile industry is changing the way we live our lives. It's not just about what information you get, but the way we, way we live our lives. How do you all think about it? I mean, you've been at the forefront, the industry has been at the forefront of access to finance uh, in many parts of the world, access to information. How do you think about inclusion as your expansion, as you sort of think about the industry itself? I'm still picturing the PowerPoint slide you should. I know. <laughs> That's what I'm just thinking. But anyhow, I don't have a PowerPoint slide, but I have a couple of other ideas. Um, I started the work, I worked in telecommunication industry in all my life. Somewhere in 2005, I started with a millennium development goal. I'm not sure that you're that old in this room that you remember it. Um, and I realized early on that connectivity was one of the most important essential things for uh, making the millennium development goals. And then we all know that fast forward, we ended up with the sustainable development goals. And you all know it's 17 goals. I worked very hard for a long time with the UN to have 18 goals. And the 18 goal would be that every people on this planet would be connected. Um, as you all know, I didn't get my 18 goal. <laughs> so this is a success story, don't worry. Uh, I continued and then of course we come into COVID uh, and I realized that 
the essential of having mobility, broadband, and cloud services in order to do your work, to get the education, healthcare, is fundamental. This is a great time to launch number 18. We didn't launch the number 18. However, what I worked with, and I've always worked with, was of course to do a coalition to see that we can actually do something about it. Um, founded the Edison Alliance two and a half years ago, uh, with, together with World Economic Forum, to bring in one billion people the next five years to be connected to, mobile, to either e healthcare, education, or financial inclusion. And now you need to remember a couple of facts that I'm going to give you, which is very important for the work we're doing. So um, 4.2 billion people today have access to internet. That's 800 million people more during the COVID. Enormous. Usually it's linear how many people are getting internet and access to connectivity. Enormous. Still, that means that we still have 3.6 billion people, roughly, that is not connected. Out of those 3.6 billion people, it's only 400 million that is not covered by broadband. OK, did you follow the numbers again? 3.6 billion not having internet, 400 million is not covered by broadband. So then you ask yourself, why, what's the problem? The problem is that what, when you think about connectivity, you need to think in three pieces. Accessibility to the technology, affordability of the technology, and the usability of the technology. Uh, the accessibility is to get access to mobile broadband or fi fiber or whatever it might be so you have connectivity. N normally, 95% of that is sponsored by private money in the world. There are, of course, great initiatives by governments, but mainly it's private money. Affordability is the l biggest hurdle we have. And that's, that's not only having the service fee, it's having a device, as Brad talked about. You need a computer, you need a, a PC, or you maybe need a, a phone or something to be connected. That's a big hurdle for many people on this earth. And finally, you need the application that is actually usable for them, meaning healthcare education, so you can be digitally connected to healthcare, or uh, education, or that you can actually do banking on the phone or digitally. All that is so important. And you cannot do that. And I think Brad said it from the beginning here. It's not the private sector that can solve the problem. It's not only the public sector can do it. You need to get together because it's going on gray zone from private to public private to more public on the, on the usability side. So the work we've been doing together with some 30 countries and some 50 of the largest companies in the world is to make commitment how you can do it and how you can actually use the technology. Getting broadband is not enough. I mean, we love that, of course, I work for Verizon. But more important, are you using it for something uh, really important and being connected to our society? It shouldn't matter where you're born or where you live in today's society to be part of our society. It shouldn't matter. I mean, I was born where you had the hospital five minutes from where I was born, and five minutes to the school. We know in many parts of Africa, that's not possible to build equally quick as the demographic is growing. So we just need to use the technology, and I always say 21st century's infrastructure is mobility, broadband, and cloud. That's the way to see that citizens can grow, they can get job, they can get growth, and they're included in our society, which usually is good for uh, any type of societal development. So that's what I've been working on, besides that I have, my, of course, my day job at Verizon. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and rally to get one billion people more connected, but using digital education, healthcare, or financial inclusion. Half time, we have added 500 million people. Uh, of the two and a half year of the program, we have two and a half year left. Uh, we're going to run it to the end, and we're going to see that one billion people more are getting connected. That's how I see how you can work with this. And I think that technology is such a core essential, but you need things on top of it. I mean, you need the application on education, et cetera, that companies like Microsoft are working with, because it's not the broadband per se. That's the fundamental in the bottom. And if I could just build on one thing that yeah, you Han, can. Han said. <laughs> I think that's good, Brad. <laughs> and with your permission. No, please. <laughs> the, um, no, I think this issue of affordability is really important. Let's yeah. just talk about the US for a moment. Um, yeah, because we were huge supporters as a company of the infrastructure legislation, I think quite rightly, to build out the rest of the broadband infrastructure in the country. But what one quickly finds is that you have people who are still not using it. And part of it is the demand, having yeah. useful apps, but it's actually affordability. And in a way that we don't really talk about much in the United States, the federal government does provide subsidies yes, for people who can't afford electricity. 
We just take that as a given. It would be intolerable for us to have people returning home without access to electricity. I think we have to think about access to connectivity together with electricity and start to put them in the same bucket. And especially in urban areas where you see you know, racial minorities, underprivileged families, um, I, I just don't think the market is going to reach everyone. Yeah, it's a, and you know, I, I just add that with where I live in Texas, I run the Texas Tribune. There are many parts where we're always talking about um, access to health care through online, yeah, and you can do that. Exactly. But there are many parts of our state that do not have online, right. and so they're driving 60, 70, 80 miles to find a doctor yeah. and, and thinking about affordability, but usability also. So yeah. how do you use the information and, and the access when, even when you have it? So, so let me just start, Brad, you, you sort of walked into, you walked into it. So how, how are you all thinking about this? Like, yes, somebody got access, but the affordability piece of it, where, where, where is uh, Microsoft's role here, but how do you work with other partners in ensuring accessibility? Well, I mean, we, we frankly try to pursue programs that will add more choices so that you get good market competition. But then I do think you end up with this income gap. And it, it, you go back to the question of can you what scales in a sustainable way? The only thing that scales in a sustainable way, in my view, for reaching, you'll call it millions of people who can't afford access, it is government support. Yeah. And so we're using our voice to call that out. And where have you seen, Hans, I'm going to go here, where have you seen where, when there's a good government public-private partnership or even where government steps in, it's been successful? No, so we, we of course, we, this Edison Alliance is covering all the uh, countries of the world. So, of course, there are countries that has been more forefront of the subsidy for low-income families or underprivileged uh, definitely, I would say that we have seen it in parts of Africa. They have started. We have seen it in parts of Asia. And we take those use cases to the other countries so they start learning. Because part of the, the work in, in Edison Alliance is not only to see that we are reaching our goal. It's actually to spread also best practices. U.S. actually have subsidies program uh, for uh, uh, low-income families uh, uh, working for broadband. Uh, but, but I think that the more we can talk about how you can do it in the best practice and how you actually spend money, but I think a lot now is tilting towards uh, what you're talking about, or the online uh, apps, I mean, healthcare, I mean, just imagine if you have 70 miles to go for a health uh, checkup, uh, if you can do that, the efficiency you can get, all, both for the system, for the public system, all that we need to think, and that's why I'm always coming back to 21st century infrastructure for me is mobility, broadband, and cloud. If we can get that in hands of everyone, we're going to have a much more efficient world, we're going to have a more educated world. Uh, so I, that's what I see, and that's why we, we, we have these lighthouse countries where we share with others what they're doing. So it's a lot of sharing at the same time as we are trying to progress it with the commitment for, from gov governments, from NGOs, and from private sector to, to make this happen. And Brad, I know you've been doing a lot in working with the governments, but um, and also just the advocacy is super important, especially from industry. But like, as you think about jobs and the work that y'all have been doing on jobs and trainings, what, what, where do you see AI coming into this? Because technology, again, is not it's there's it's not static. It's constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. There's a lot of fear <laughs> out in the world. Um, how do you see as the rapid transformations are taking place, where that inclusion in the innovations is taking place? Well, let me just take one slice of that. And I think you know, one of our goals is and should be to get the best, best benefit out of what AI has to offer. So one of the big priorities for us like this year, this month, is to really innovate in ways that will make AI a more powerful tool for nonprofits mm -hmm. because they are so indispensable for broadening growth. And when you think about what nonprofits do, I mean, many of you know this far better than me, but first of all, you have to manage relationships with donors. You may manage relationships with volunteers. You deliver programs and you need to you know, deliver them efficiently and then measure and assess their impact. And we really see these new advances in AI as a fundamental breakthrough, really, in all of those areas. You know, so we're creating new AI features for you know, the Microsoft Cloud for nonprofits, for even things like Excel, you know, so that you know, we are finding you can take something like a donor management task 
that costs, say, $15 to $30 of, say, people time plus technology, and with this new AI, the cost of that same task is reduced under a dollar. So you just think about what that can do to accelerate the work of nonprofits. And when we think about what it can do to analyze data and better inform you know, impact assessments in the direction of philanthropy. You know, we think it's extraordinary. So we're very enthusiastic about that. And you know, what I love about what our philanthropies team is doing is they're actually spending this time getting out and listening to nonprofits, sort of ideating together, understanding what is it that nonprofits could benefit from the most. We'll then put that into our features and then deliver that. And then we have this broader array. We've got to ensure that this is done safely, that it's done responsibly. We'll do that too. I mean, we've been working on that since 2017. But if we can deliver new benefits to nonprofits, that's going to that's going to drive inclusive growth for the world. Absolutely. And Hans, same innovations in the mobile industry. Lots happening on a regular basis. Where do you see the opportunities here from? for innovation to be more inclusive? No, I think that every time we get new technologies, the, the technologies are better. They can provide more and more. Uh, I mean, thinking about what 5G can do today, I mean, uh, today we can actually do uh, uh, broadband with wireless, which we never can done before because the capacity on 4G was not good enough. And I can, so if I take you back to last year, which, you know, I'm, I have an earnings call pretty soon, so I need to go back. And last year when I reported, we, we our fastest growing- You want to give us news today? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, then I think my chief legal officer will lift me out here. Uh, but, uh, uh, or maybe you, Brad. Uh, uh, but uh, our fastest growing business last year was fixed wireless access. We added almost 350, 370,000 new subscribers with 5G connectivity the last mile. And again, that's an innovation because it's so much quicker to get uh, out broadband to uh, to the suburbs, to the rural areas by using wireless. You, you still need fiber. So fiber is important because you're going to transport all the data backwards. But the last mile is wireless. Those type of innovations, next generation uh, uh, 5G, of course, has much more power and throughput. So you can have AI at the edge doing the right things. And I, I fully agree with Brad. It has to be responsible. Every new technology is great to find new things. You just need to be very careful to see the ramification of them uh, and see that you're protecting your customers and the privacy and all of that. But of course, new uh, technologies always create new opportunities. Shortly, usually takes out a little bit job, but almost always creating more opportunities. I, I remember the conversation about the mobility come or digitalization come. That's going to take millions of works out. Yeah, it will, but it will create something new. And that's how we need to think about technology and efficiency and any type of new technology. So we see a lot of things happening on the wireless side, and uh, which will continue to the next century. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing all the innovations and the opportunities, because I do think uh, it's easy to talk about what's not working, but it's also easy to talk about what is working. And so uh, really excited about what you all both, what you both are doing, but really where the industries are going to go. Thank you both for coming today, and thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you.